Right now, uh, I have a pleasure to receive Christian Agens from UCSB, and then thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Christian Aganze. I'm a grad student at UC San Diego, and this is my last year, and then I'm going to be a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, I'm going to present a talk on uh, um, a paper that we're working on with Chitske, who's sitting there, and Sarah Pearson on uh, detecting gaps in streams in external galaxies with Roman. Um, so just a little bit of an outline. I'm going to talk about uh, just the background information about this, uh, why we're doing this, and then talk a little bit about simulations of uh, streams and gaps, and then uh, how we use an automatic tool that uh, Gabi Contario came up with, and then I'm going to summarize this. So the motivation is that we know that uh, large cosmological simulations that use dark matter um, predict different number of subhalos, uh, depending on the model of dark matter that they use. So here I'm showing a, a picture that I took from the Bullock and Bolian Cochin uh, review paper. Uh, on the left side, I'm showing what a Milky Way size um, halo will look like with a bunch of uh, subhalos around it and, and satellites. And then on the right side, I'm showing a warm dark matter model. So you can see clearly in the warm dark matter case, you have less stuff. Um, and this is good, and we're trying to test this with different models of, um, of streams. Uh, in the Milky Way, we've seen uh, a lot of streams. So streams are these uh, tidal features that you see around galaxies uh, or inside galaxies. Uh, here, I'm just showing a, a compilation of all the streams you know about in the Milky Way. So we have like 100 of them. Uh, this is compil compiled from the Matteo Gulf Streams um, catalog or code. Uh, this is just a, I think this is a galactic uh, latitude versus longitude map uh, where they're just plotting all the streams. You can see some of the known ones like uh, Sagittarius, which is this big stream that goes through the center. Uh, I'm going to be talking about PAL-5, uh, the coloring here, I can't identify it. But this is really, uh, we've seen a lot of these um, uh, streams in the Milky Way, and we're trying to use them to, as tools to detect dark matter. Uh, so how this works is we we see a Milky Way uh, stream like this. So this is a uh, GD1. I'm showing here on the x-axis. I'm plotting the uh, coordinates along the, the stream. And this is taken from the Bonas et al. 2019. Um, you can see there is a gap here, this feature here. Um, let me use the button. All right, this is a gap. Um, and this gap can be caused by dark matter subhalo, and they were able to model it. So on top here, you have the data from Gaia. In the bottom, you have the actual model. Uh, and the model turns out that this is like a 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass subhalo that went through the stream and created this gap. And it's kind of a little bit of a small scale radius for this subhalo, but they were able to reproduce it. Uh, the question is, we want to go beyond the Milky Way because uh, we only have 100 streams in the Milky Way, and only, I, I think, a few of them have gaps. So we want to actually increase the sample sizes. So to do that, we just go in other galaxies, starting with Andromeda. Uh, so in other galaxies, people have seen streams. So they have these type of features here. I'm showing some examples of that from the uh, Stellar Stream Legacy Survey. Um, you can see that some of these, uh, most of these are dwarf galaxy streams that, um, again, dwarf galaxies have been um, teared up. Um, but Roman, Euclid, and Rubin will detect more of this. Uh, so our goal, again, is to, to go after this with Roman. Um, so people are trying to look for streams uh, in other galaxies, starting with, with Andromeda. So this is an example of a, a work that uh, Sarah Pearson uh, led. And they were looking for uh, globular class of streams in M31 and M33. They couldn't find, uh, they were able to identify some candidates, but uh, they couldn't confirm them. Um, because just the magnitude limit at uh, the sensitivity of pandas wasn't enough to actually see these features, or maybe they're not there. Uh, so they predicted though that if you use Roman, uh, this is the 2019 paper. So this is uh, Pearson and Stackenberg uh, 2019, where if you look at, uh, there's just one field of view of Roman. So this is like uh, um, 30, uh, 0.52 degree square. Uh, this is in Andromeda, so this is, a stream that will be at 15 kpc, this will be at 35 kpc, this will be at uh, uh, 55 kpc. 
Uh, I think the small streams here is like PAL5, so 50,000 solar mass stream. And then the other stream is like, uh, I think five times that and 10 times that. Uh, in this in these simulations, they were just really just kind of painting up, painting stars on the image really. Uh, but the numbers are really are correct. Uh, they're based on the luminosity function of PAL5. Um, and then you can see this by eye, right? So this, this was their conclusion. Uh, our goal in this paper is try to see if you can actually see gaps uh, in these streams. So that's it, what we're trying to answer. So to do that, we just have to create a stream uh, realistically and then uh, create a gap in the stream and then uh, re-simulate that and see if we can actually observe it. Uh, so to do that, we use this uh, tool uh, called Gala. It's a, uh, it's a code that Adrian Pressman developed. And this I'm just showing like a very um, um, extreme version of that where you have like a 10 to the S solar mass subhalo that went, goes through a stream and uh, uh, kind of splits the stream apart. Um, so the uh, velocity impact that the stream, the subhalo puts in the stream depends on its, on its mass and then scale radius of the subhalo and the relative velocity between the, the stream and the subhalo. Um, but there's other factors. Uh, but this has been explored in other papers that you can go look at. Um, our goal here was really just to create a gap and see if we can observe it. So we did that. So we simulated a bunch of streams that are in um, M31-like uh, potential. Here we're using uh, something like from CAFE 2019, 2018, uh, which has uh, like an NFW halo. Uh, we have, have a bulge in the, in the disk as well. And then we are um, running a bunch of streams in there. So we have like a stream, this, this is all 50,000 solar mass, but it was perturbed. This one was per perturbed by two, 10 to the six solar mass. This one was perturbed by five, 10 to the six solar mass. This one was uh, perturbed by 10, 10 to the seven solar mass. You can see that the gap gets larger with the mass of, this, um, of the subhalo. And this here I'm plotting like the X axis here, and then I'm just counting the number of stars per KPC. Uh, and just another way to visualize that gap. So the gap is larger uh, if you have a larger sub halo. So then we can re-simulate that uh, realistic stars. So we, we know roughly what the metallicity of uh, stars in a halo of M31 look like, and we know the, uh, the IMF, so we just use a group IMF. Um, we use the parsec isochrons uh, to re-simulate those stars. And then we kind of try to model the density Along in, in a stellar halo of, of M31. Also, we simulate Milky Way backgrounds um, or foregrounds um, by using a, some kind of density law from uh, Jurich at all. So we have a Milky Way disk and a halo. Uh, and then we put this in Roman filters and then we cut this a magnitude of 26, sorry, 27 and 20, uh, 29 or 20, 28.69. Um, this I'm just showing here the CMD. So this is Roman R minus Z versus Roman Z. Uh, and this is, will be like the M31 stars and this will be the Milky Way. Um, so we simulate the realistic stars and then we put the stream inside the, these images. So we're gonna just do like stellar count maps, uh, which are really like images, um, but this is just num star at each position. And we're overplotting the stream uh, on top of that. Um, so this is, the scale here is like 10 arc minutes. So this is like 30 by 30 or 32 by 32 arc minutes. Um, this is again, just M31. Uh, you can see the gap clearly here, at least in the uh, 35 KPC case. And then you can see that at 55 KPC. And this is actually just exposed for one hour. Uh, so we wanted to see if we can do that at larger distances. Um, so for larger distances, you just take M31 and we moved it to larger distances. We didn't really have a data for uh, other galaxies. So we just took M31 and we just moved it further away and then made the same cuts. Um, we can see the gap here at 0.8 megaparsec. And then if you get to one megaparsec, you can still see it. Uh, not sure if you can see it beyond that. Uh, so we just say that, you know, by eye, you can see this within one megaparsec. And this is a gap from a five, 10 to the six sub halo. Uh, which is really good because we're testing different uh, uh, sub mass functions there, depending on the dark matter model that you assume. So we wanted to see if we can do this automatically instead of just saying, um, let's use a, uh, a tool that can actually find this. So the assumption here, you've taken an image, uh, you use some stream finding code that finds a stream, 
And then we have this code by Gabby Contardo that just find gaps in. Uh, this was designed really to find gaps in anything, but we are using here to find uh, gaps in a stream. So here is an example of a five KPC by two KPC cutout. So near the stream. Uh, and you can go install this code if you want to play with it here. Uh, I'll put the link. Um, so we have a small cutout there. So this is at a 55, 55 KPC. The gap is supposed to be here. Um, and then you can just do a density map. So these are density contours. Um, uh, this is normalized density. You can see that it's denser at the center. Um, and then you can use this gap statistic that kind of shows you where the um, where the gap is. So this is really based on the uh, uh, the Hessian of this density map here. And if you take the maximum eigenvalues of that, you get uh, this map here. And that's really that just tells us the location of the gap. Um, and then you can use the minimum eigenvalues to find uh, the stream. Um, and then you can just fit, you can fit a, a second degree polynomial to that. This is what we did. Uh, so in this case, I'm showing on the x-axis, I'm showing again, the stars in the background are stars in the, in the image. Each one of these dot here is this map of maximum eigenvalues um, that I've only taken, sorry, the blue ones. Uh, I've only taken like the top 90 percentile. And then the, um, the yellow ones, not yellow, sorry, the orange ones are the streams, uh, and you can just again feed the yellow ones to uh, the orange one to, uh, to a second degree polynomial. And then this blue map here will tell you the location of the gap. Um, so, one way to measure how this changes of distance is just to see how that location varies with distance. So, we can do this multiple times, uh, re simulate a stream starting from the, you know, the isochrones and then uh, resimulate basically the whole image um, and then measure. So this would supposed to be the gap point. So the grid here are uh, everything in this uh, box here, which are these stars that you can see. Uh, you can just measure how far they, they deviate from the center of this image because we put the gap at the center by design. Um, and then you can just take the median of that and then do that five times. So five iteration for each distance and you see where that starts to flare up and you can say that's our detection limit. This is one way to do it, uh, but you can think of other multiple creative ways of doing that. So it looks like we can find the gaps at least at up to two, three megaparsec. Uh, and here I have some other plots showing that uh, for 55 KPC, uh, 35 KPC and uh, 50, uh, so 15, 35, and 55 KPC. And this is on this uh, left side, I have one hour. Here I have a thousand second. Uh, a th one hour is much, a little bit better than a thousand second, but our conclusion here is that you can see these gaps within uh, two to three megaparsec, uh, which is exciting because now we can start to actually, uh, um, you can actually start to see, um, use these gaps to constrain uh, dark matter models. So here's my summary. So we, um, the goal here was to simulate streams, uh, global class of streams, starting with PAL5 as an example, and to um, put this in a realistic potential, simulate realistic stars, um, including nuclear foregrounds, and then try to see if we can see these gaps by eye or using an automatic tool. And our conclusion here is that we can see this within two to three megaparsec, which contains around 200 galaxies, I believe, and that's uh, mostly dwarf galaxies, though. So, uh, but this is again potentially you can stack images and you can expose for longer. Uh, this kind of builds a case for actually doing a survey with Andromeda, uh, so with Roman. Uh, so some limitation of this work include that we didn't really consider how feasible star galaxy separation will be at this magnitude uh, of 28. Um, we didn't really include the extension, although this will be in the future work that we're going to do. Um, and then um, we only looked at PAL-5, but we can imagine if we use uh, more massive streams or less massive streams. Um, and this we only did M31 because that's what we had pandas data for. Uh, if the isochrones will change, uh, how well can you see this in other, all kinds of galaxies in a local volume? So these are my conclusion and I will, uh, Take your questions. Thank you so much.
Thanks. Uh, let's start. Uh, if you please. Thank you, Christian. Really interesting. This is Martin Ray. Um, I was wondering whether there was there were prospects for a survey to with Roman to map some of these streams. Is this now that you've shown that they might be visible quite convincingly extragalactically? Can is there a prospect to build an actual survey to remap Panda the pandas fields or something like this? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a survey. This we're just doing this for the uh, wild fields, uh, like the is it the wild field survey, whatever the magnitude they're, call, they're calling. I don't know if there's a dedicated survey to actually find uh, streams in Andromeda. That'd be a cool pr a proposal to do. Uh, I don't know if Jiske knows if there's one that's happening. Sorry, what's your name? I'm Martin Ray. Thanks. Yeah, so I think that hasn't been decided yet, but there's so much science to do with the halo of M31 that I would expect the, at least M31 to be covered in a survey. Um, how many other galaxies in the Neymar universe, like in with their full stellar halos, that's probably gonna be decided in the next few years. And just to add to that, um, yeah, there's a, a... Uh, about a quarter of um, Roman's observing time is geo, like HST. Um, there was a science investigation team um, called Wings that did a ton of modeling of this, thinking not just about Andromeda, but thinking about many nearby galaxies where you could get, you know, in two, three, four shots, um, the whole of the halo and how deep could, you could go at one, two, three, four, five megaparsecs. Um, so there's a whole there's a whole group led by, um, oh. Thank you, Ben Williams, <laughs> University of uh, uh, Washington, um, studying this exact question in, in a lot of detail. Uh, real quick, and putting on my Roman hat, this is John Wick. Uh, you also can write a proposal in the next 10 hours, 45 minutes, and submit it for <laughs> the Rose's uh, Roman white pill science. Sorry, we have two questions here. I think that he's first and then you. Hi, Andreas Berlin. Um, sorry if you said this before. How many gaps do you expect to find in the halo of a single galaxy for like Lambda CDM? The question is how many gaps do you expect to see in a halo of a galaxy? Um, I guess it depends on the stream. Uh, last, I saw a paper recently by the fire simulation team saying that you expect to see, at least in GD1, like uh, three to four interactions per giga year. Um, and this, these streams are usually like uh, three gig a year. Uh, at least for this, we run like two, three gig a year. Uh, so if you, you can get three, four uh, interactions, I don't know how many of them will create gaps uh, that are visible. So that can kind of tell you, uh, at least in one stream, um, and we have a hundred of them in the Milky Way. Um, so that kind of tells you roughly what the numbers will be. Um, Francisco Gastander. And just a comment, you know, the European Space Agency has just selected a mission called Arrakis, that is a very small mission, to go and, and, and map uh, nearby galaxies to very low surface brightness. And, and I was wondering, what are the surface brightness that you require to detect these gaps? Arrakis? Mirakis? Uh, the question is, what's the surface brightness is for these streams. Uh, I think for at least in this paper that Pearson, if I remember correctly, uh, just can correct me. Uh, I think they were saying like 33 magnitude per second square. Um, mm. Is that right? For, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess I had a similar question uh, from the European perspective. So Euclid is coming uh, soon. Yeah. So I was wondering if you know you had look at you know what Euclid can do in that uh, uh, for the science case and yeah. how is competitive compared to Roman. Yeah, Euclid is exciting as well. I'm excited about Euclid because uh, I usually work on Loma stars and brown dwarfs, and it's kind of like Roman. Uh, so, but Euclid is um, I don't know what the field of you there is. I don't quite remember. Uh, 
I know Roman is great because this large shooter, you can just take one shot and see it. Um, I don't quite remember what Euclid is. It's still, you know, a great right, similar. Hmm? It's not as deep. Probably is the depth. Half a square degree. degree. Okay, that's um, yeah, that's a little bit smaller than this, but uh, I think this is point, point, point fifty two, so it's actually pretty close. Um, yeah. Yeah. But Euclid is the same space telescope, similar size. Yeah. So if it's so that's why I'm wondering, and one hour exposure, yeah, it's not that deep. So. Yeah, this is 0.5 square degrees. So if, if Euclid is also 0.5 square degrees, that's, that's great. Then you can actually do a similar program. Um, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, 30, 30 by 30 arc minute square. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Elise Dareford. Um, really great talk. Uh, so I was wondering, you said that you only did this, um, looking at M31 like hosts. Um, and I was just wondering, like, are you planning on going beyond that? And then I guess kind of a follow-up to that, like, do you see specific challenges in, like, looking at different types of galaxy hosts, but also maybe different, like, benefits from looking at streams in different types of hosts? Yeah, uh, so the question is, if I, I see um, this, if I should we short to this in other galaxies, then what are the benefits and drawbacks for that? Yeah. I think, yeah, we should definitely try to do this in other galaxies. Um, are they more visible in other galaxies? Depends on uh, the isochrones, uh, those, the, the composition of the halos of those galaxies. And, the, and if they're smaller, like dwarf galaxies, uh, do they actually have these globular cluster streams that have gaps in them? Um, um, so that's, and then exploring that question will in, in involve doing a survey of all these, yeah, all these galaxies. So that'd be great. Um, and it seems like there's a, are these ideas to try to do a survey of all uh, you know, local galaxies. Oh, now it's red. <laughs> Uh, I'm Sabrina Apple. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I was wondering, are there other processes aside from interacting with these dark subhalos that might produce these gaps? And on kind of a related note, I noticed that the um, automatic de gap detector that you're using is really impressive. With that sensitivity, are you concerned about um, the properties of globular clusters? playing a role in producing these gaps or being essentially being a contaminant to detecting gaps due to these subhalos, if, yeah. if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so let me see if I understand. The, so the first part of the question is whether uh, there are other factors that can make gaps in streams. Yeah, and that has, that has been explored. Uh, if you have an interaction with uh, um, anything really, like a giant molecular cloud, or if the stream stays too close to the bar, you can induce resonances that will and make the gap. So there's so many uh, other factors that can actually make gaps. But having large statistical samples would be great. You can, if you know, if the streams are too far in the halo, uh, not close to the disk uh, or the bar, you can be confident that the gap is probably from um, uh, some halo instead of like a giant molecular cloud or anything. The second part of the question is whether uh, properties of globular classes can make a contaminant in these images, is that right? I don't quite understand the second part. Yeah, just in general, whether there are aspects of globular cluster properties or multiple populations that might play a role in producing uh, these gaps or make them harder to detect. Right, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point. I'm not super familiar with global cluster literature. I know the multiple population properties is a thing. Uh, if, if, if you mean that, you know, you create like multiple populations that spatially you can see like different uh, signatures in the stream. Uh, I'm not quite sure that's something interesting. I don't know if you know more about that, but, but I don't, uh, that's a good point uh, that can be explored. Thank you. Uh, so, Chia Takure. Um, so I had two questions. Uh, so one is, if I remember correctly, you're using a Krupa IMF. That's right, yeah. Um, does, 
So does that have an effect on how much if you use some more, I guess, a more realistic IMF? Uh, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> uh yeah especially with the number numbers of uh, sm smaller uh, stars right yeah i mean yes that's, yes that's... yeah the question is whether using a more realistic imf will actually uh, affect our numbers yes yeah, so our numbers are rough in a sense that there's so many other factors that actually come yeah. into play sure. uh we try to model like the magnitude completeness in in pandas and sort mm -hmm. of we can scale it to the right luminosity function there's uh, what is the uncertainty of, you know, with exposure time here. There's so many effects that actually come into play when you actually mm -hmm. just look at the raw number counts. Um, so we're not trying to make that perfect, but it is true that if you explore probably different IMFs, you might get a slightly different number of stars mm -hmm. in these images, uh, which kind of changes your density contrast that mm -hmm. you uh, you can detect with the streams too. Yeah. All right. And uh, the second question is, uh, so what scale of gaps you're looking at or what you're interested in mm. uh, and what would be interesting uh, if you don't have like for, let's say if you want to uh, constrain dark matter models what would be a interesting scale of gaps that you should look at yeah so the question is about the scale of gaps in this case uh, if we mean if you mean like the mass of the sub halos that create these yeah, gaps right. uh, we're looking between uh, anything below 10 to the 7 solar mass and here we're looking at 5, 10 to the 6, and the gaps tend to be like a KPC, uh, at least the ones we created. You can create a longer gap if you uh, if you make the stream line run a long time after it's been interacted, after it has interacted with a subhalo. Uh, so, but these are like on a scale of a KPC or 1.5 KPC. Uh, so the interesting part is, you know, those uh, um, subhalo masses. Uh, the problem is there are so many uh, variables in actually determining the final size of the gap. Uh, it's not just this, again, it's here. I have like a, you know, it's it's not just the subhalo mass, it's also the scale radius, uh, the relative velocity. So we chose a relative velocity of 50 kilometers per second in our simulation. Um, but you can imagine that the relative velocity is higher, you get a smaller gap. So there's so many degeneracies. I think I had a slide for all of those things uh, at the end, somewhere at the end. Um, this was a sketch from, um, a talk by I think Adrian uh, Parcelin, uh, where they show like you know different morphologies of the stream basically depending on the velocity of impact, the scale radius of subhalo, the mass. Um, but the fact that you can create a mass, uh, a gap with this uh, in this mass re range that you can actually see, that's exciting. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, so thanks again, and let's And that's it. Uh, we are going to have our break, and let's see everyone here at 11 a.m. <laughs>